Kära vänner, välkomna till dagens festligheter. Jag, jag har kallat det för arbetande festligheter eftersom vi också ska få ganska mycket substans. Trots allt så är det 30-årsfest och då känner man sig ungdomlig och energisk. Så vi ska fortsätta i detta energiska spår även idag. 30 år men också FN-dagen mitt i det största kanske ifrågasättandet av det multilaterala samarbetets möjligheter. Så det krävs nog arbete. Det är också dessvärre exakt åtta månader sedan Rysslands anfall mot Ukraina startade. Så det finns många anledningar att samtala om fred och att kunna vara tillsammans och ta kraft av varandra. I det långa loppet finns inget annat förstås än de fredliga medlen. Det är vi alla medvetna om. Det svåra är dock att kunna hålla i sinnet två saker samtidigt. Både det korta loppet som kan behöva vissa åtgärder och det långa loppet som är det som vi måste satsa på på sikt. Och det är många som inte klarar av att hålla det korta och det långa loppet. En som dock måste göra det är vår utrikesminister Pekka Havisto och han har skickat en hälsning. Så vi ska börja med honom. Bästa vänner av Ålands fredsinstitut, ärade åhörare. Jag gratulerar idag varmt Ålands fredsinstitut och det som deltagit i institutets verksamhet. Fredsinstitutet har under 30 års tid gjort ett viktigt, praktiskt och vetenskapligt arbete inom freds- och konfliktsmedlingsfrågor med utgångspunkt i Ålands exempel. Fredsinstitutets forskningsämnen som gäller självstyrelse, minoritetsfrågor, demilitarisering och konfliktlösning är mer aktuella än någonsin. Konfliktförebyggande och fredsmedling är en av hörnstenarna i Finlands utrikespolitik. Att stärka nätverket av finska fredsförmedlare är en viktig del av detta genomförande. Vi lever i instabila tider. Användningen av vapen har ökat, konflikterna är mer komplexa och det regelbaserade internationella systemet som konfliktlösningsmekanism ifrågasätts. I den förändrade verksamhetsmiljön framhålls Fredsinstitutets verksamhet som producent av faktbaserad information, förmedlare och nätverksbyggare och stärker Finlands arbete med fredslösning och diplomati. Jag tackar alla som har deltagit i Fredsinstitutets arbete för ert arbete om Ålands exempel för att sprida kännedom om det. Jag vill tacka er för gott samarbete med utrikesministeriet. Man måste nämna också kontaktgruppen för utrikesministeriet och Ålands landskapsregering inom vilken användningen av Ålands exempel utvecklats som en del av den gemensamma seminarieverksamheten. I detta sammanhang vill jag ännu tacka för förra månaders besök på Åland där jag hade nöjet att träffa Ålands Fredsinstituts direktör och diskutera institutets arbete. Jag avslutar mitt anförande med att önska er mycket framgång för de kommande åren och en givande diskussion idag. Tack! Perhaps, yes, now it works. So my only task today is to hand over to someone else. It's the most pleasant of parties. Um, and, and the person I will hand over to is our Orland Islands Peace Fellow, Orland Peace Fellow, that is the correct title. Uh, och han är engelskspråkig och det är därför jag då övergår till engelska. Uh, we will be hearing uh, Dr. Ralph Wild speaking about human rights in occupied territories. And he is the second 
Orland Peace Fellow. The first one was here last year, and he defended his doctoral thesis last week, in fact, uh, about um, paradiplomacy and the effect of conflict on paradiplomatic activities. So it is wonderful that today we have a different angle through the work of Ralph Wild. And not all of you are international lawyers, but if you were international lawyers, you would know the name Ralph Wild very, very well. Because he has written one, perhaps the only major work on the international administration of territories, which is remarkable in view of the fact that we have such numerous examples of international administration of territories. He has received very many um, acclamations and prizes, and we were very gladly surprised when he applied for the Orland Peace Fellowship. And I would uh, like to thank especially the research board of the Peace Institute, which helped to select the, uh, this year's Orland Peace Fellow uh, among more than 60 applications. So you don't think anyone wants to come to Orland in the autumn, but there are quite a few people who are intrigued by this uh, odd place in the middle of the Baltic Sea. And um, before I just hand over to Ralph, I think that he is a remarkable person, not only because of his legal rigor, what else can you expect by an English lawyer? They are very, very thorough. Um, but he is also an enormously warm person and committed personally to the issues he engages with. So I think he is the best kind of researcher to have as an Orland Peace Fellow, combining, if you want, personal commitment and activism even with legal rigor. The floor is yours, Ralph. Well, thank you very much. It's such a great pleasure and um, an honor to be here uh, with you delivering this lecture and more generally to be here on Oland and to have the great privilege to have been uh, selected for uh, the Peace Fellowship. Um, it's an, uh, it really is an honor. I've, um, I've been having such um, an enjoyable and rewarding time uh, here with the wonderful um, uh, staff uh, uh, who now are already friends at the um, Institute who've made me feel very welcome. Uh, so thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, and today um, I'd like to set the scene for uh, the lecture by um, taking you to um, Palestine. Um, you may remember, you may recognize the figure there on the slide, uh, the Al Jazeera journalist Shirin Abu Akla. Um, in May two th um, uh, this year, um, the world was, of course, shocked uh, when she was killed uh, by a shot fired by Israeli soldiers in Jenin. And then the pallbearers of her coffin were themselves attacked by Israeli soldiers at the St. Joseph Hospital in Sheikh Jarrah in Al-Quds, uh, somewhere I happen to be uh, working very nearby to uh, at that time. Um, now, the common approach taken by many, particularly international observers of the killing and the attack on the pallbearers, was to analyze these particular incidents in terms of whether or not, in each case, the use of force was justified. So with the killing, it was asked whether it's permissible to target journalists or whether somehow the killing might have been permissible as collateral damage. And in the violence against the pallbearers, it was asked whether there was a security uh, concern uh, in that particular place at that time, and if so, whether the response was necessary and proportionate. The suggested conclusion from many was that the killing and the attack were unjustified, the shooting involved the deliberate targeting of someone who should be protected, a journalist, and there was no security need in the hospital in the first place 
that required the soldiers to respond, let, let alone the, in, in the way that they did in the violence against the pallbearers. Now, this approach encapsulates how human rights questions are commonly addressed when states act extraterritorially, i.e. outside their sovereign borders, including action that involves the use of military force, including a military occupation, and where this action has a negative impact on human rights. Many disputed territories in the world involve as a crucial element, extraterritorial activity like this. Sometimes the extraterritorial activity involves the state asserting sovereignty for itself over the territory in question. This is the case with Israel in East Jerusalem. There is on the slide a picture of um, Damascus Gate in uh, Al-Quds, Jerusalem where um, the attack on the poor bearers happened very close to uh, the old city of Jerusalem, and also the Golan, Morocco in Western Sahara, Russia in Crimea, and also, of course, this year, uh, with the eastern parts of Ukraine also with an assertion of sovereignty, and the United Kingdom with respect to the Chagos Archipelago, uh, which it calls the British Indian Ocean Territory on the basis of a legally invalid claim to sovereignty, territory, uh, an archipelago which is legally part of Mauritius. In other cases, extraterritorial activity involves the state supporting a secessionist entity in its claim to sovereignty as an independent state over the area in question. Examples of this would be Turkey and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which purports to be an independent state and territory that is legally part of the state of Cyprus. Russia with the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic purporting to be states in territories that are legally uh, part of the sovereign territory of Ukraine, before, of course, the subsequent purported annexation of these territories into Russia this year. Russia again with the republics of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, purporting to be states in territories that are legally part of the sovereign territory of Georgia. Russia yet again with the uh, Prednistrian uh, Republic uh, of um, uh, Moldova, also called Transnistria, which purports to be a state in territory that is legally part of the territory of Moldova, and Armenia, with the uh, Republic of Artsakh, uh, which purports to be a state in territory that is legally part of the sovereign territory of uh, Azerbaijan. In yet other cases, the extraterritorial activity may not involve a claim of sovereignty by the state, either for itself or for a secessionist proxy, but is concerned with some other, other policy, which is also related in one way or another with a dispute over the territory, such as the war by Russia in Ukraine this year beyond the elements of it concerning the East, Israel's occupation of the West Bank beyond East Jerusalem since 1967, here illustrated by uh, the wall constructed in part of Palestinian territory, including Janine, where Shirin Abu Akhla was killed, an arrangement which may be understood in part as a means of preventing or delaying the creation of a Palestinian state as a general matter, including for security reasons, potentially enabling extensions of Israeli territorial sovereignty in areas of the West Bank, hence the association of this with implanting settlements, and through uh, potentially then linking this in the future at some point to potentially further annexations beyond East Jerusalem, and also gaining facts on the ground, advantages that might be beneficial to some eventual future land for peace deal. Now, one of the main developments of international human rights law 
over the past two decades has been the emergence and consolidated acceptance of the idea that human rights obligations apply extraterritorially. Indeed, this idea came out partly of cases brought by Greek Cypriots and the state of Cyprus against Turkey before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg here in the picture. Those cases involved complaints of certain violations of human rights perpetrated against Greek Cypriots in the northern area controlled by the TRNC, for example, in preventing them from being able to access their, and use their land and property there. A related jurisprudential position that's also been consolidated at the same time is that international human rights law applies in wartime situations. And I've here put up the symbol of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights as some of its decisions have affirmed uh, that proposition that human rights legal standards don't only apply in uh, peacetime, they also apply in times of armed conflict. So this means that in any of these situations that I've uh, reviewed in the examples, involving the use of force in disputed territories by foreign states, we have two distinct international law regimes in operation, both of which purport to offer what we might understand as human rights protections. So on the one hand, we have the laws of war, also known as international humanitarian law, or the Jos in Bello, reflected here by the emblem of the organizations that are, have been set up to act as safeguards for this area of international uh, law, for example, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. This is the law, for example, of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and covers such things as the protection of civilians in wartime and certain basic standards concerning the treatment of prisoners of war. Some extreme violations of this area of law, the Jos in Bello, international humanitarian law, are made criminal on an individual level, so-called war crimes. On the other hand, we have international human rights law, here the symbol of human rights within the United Nations system, such as the European Convention on Human Rights, that treaty that was at issue in those cases concerning northern Cyprus, determined in the cases to be applicable extraterritorially and therefore also in wartime situations. So to go back then to the killing of Shirin Abu Akhla and the attack on her pallbearers, the response by commentators that I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture to analyze these particular incidents in terms of whether or not in each case the force used was justified is an approach which is reflected in the legal benchmarks that these two areas of international law purport to offer. Indeed, when the legality of these incidents was discussed, this in usually involved the application of these areas of international law by both critics of what happened and by Israel in attempting to justify its action. Critics said that these areas of law were breached. Israel said that these areas of law were complied with. What united everyone was that this was the way to think about the situation as a general matter and as far as which areas of international law are relevant and need to be applied to it. I'd like to suggest that such an approach is mistaken. Focusing only at this level of analysis and exclusively in relation to these areas of law, <clears throat> 
ignores a more fundamental point, which Palestinian human rights activist Diana Butu highlighted when commenting on the killing in an interview herself on Al Jazeera given shortly afterwards, that this killing was only possible because the Israeli soldiers were in Janin in the first place. What Diana Butu was trying to do was shift the level of analysis to take in the broader context, the occupation itself, and understanding it as a form of oppression and an act of violence, because it's an exercise of authority that is in and of itself illegitimate. Now, it might be said that considering things in these existential terms is not a legal matter. It is a matter of politics only, not also international law. International human rights standards and the Geneva Conventions are about ensuring that certain standards are complied with. But the broader question of whether Israel should even be exercising authority in Jenin or East Jerusalem is a matter of politics only. So, indeed, we don't hear, for example, the main international human rights NGOs, such as Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, or the International Guardian of the Geneva Conventions, the ICRC, discussing whether or not this authority should be in existence in the first place. But the fact that Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its purported annexation of the eastern provinces is being condemned as an aggression and that this is, as such, described as an illegal war should give these commentators pause for thought. When it comes to that action, the critique and the invocation of the law is not limited to atrocities perpetrated by Russia. It is also concerned with the war itself. Indeed, all the other activities that I've mentioned in this, the review earlier in this lecture are also actually in and of themselves unlawful and or operate on a basis that is internationally legally invalid. This, is, this matter is distinct from the legality, including in human rights compliance terms, in how they are conducted. It is a matter of the legality of the basis on which they are in operation in the first place. Extraterritorial activity concerned with the assertion of a legally invalid claim to sovereignty over the area in question by that state, which of course then the state doesn't regard as extraterritorial at all, such as Israel's purported annexation of um, East Jerusalem, here reflected in the picture of Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Old City, Russia's purported annexation of Crimea, and this year parts of the eastern uh, parts of Ukraine, or in support of legally invalid claims by secessionist entities, such as Turkey's support for the, for the TRNC. This necessarily involves a fundamental interference in the sovereign entitlements of the host sovereign entity, whether it is a state or it's a non-state sovereign entity, as in the Palestinian people. So in the examples, as well as the Palestinian people, the states, of course, whose sovereignty is being interfered with in the, it, through these annexations, uh, or, or support for secessionist entities would be the states of Ukraine and Cyprus. In consequence, these actions are violations of international law and an exercise of authority over the territory that is internationally legally invalid. Relatedly, an assertion of state sovereignty by a secessionist entity that is not legally what it claims to be a state, 
is similarly legally invalid. Other extraterritorial activities that aren't bound up in asserting a legally invalid position on sovereignty over the area in question. So perhaps we might think about Russia's military action, its war in Ukraine more generally outside of the areas that have been purportedly annexed, can also constitute an unlawful interference in sovereignty simply by virtue of the exercise of authority, including, of course, through the use of military force, and the absence of a valid international legal basis for doing so. Any such exercise is of its nature an interference in the sovereign entitlement of the host sovereign entity, which therefore falls to be legally justified. The area of international law here is the international law on the use of force, the jus ad bellum. You may have been uh, uh, had this referred to you in the context of describing uh, the Russian act, uh, invasion uh, and military action in Ukraine as illegal aggression. What commentators are referring to there is the illegality of the war when it comes to the international law on the use of force, when states can go to war, rather than the law regulating the conduct of armed conflict when it happens, the law in the Geneva Conventions. So when there is no legal justification in this area of law, which of course is the case with Russia and Ukraine, the activity itself is existentially illegitimate, an illegal violation of the sovereignty of the host entity, here, of course, Ukraine. And in consequence, everything that's done there by Russia is a legally invalid exercise of authority over the territory in question. Now, as I've mentioned, these activities will also be regulated by the laws of war, including occupation law and human rights law applying extraterritorially. But having these legal regimes in play and the states potentially even complying with them, which is not something sadly that we see happening, this doesn't have any normative effect on the existential matter of the illegal and invalid exercise of authority itself, in terms of somehow making the exercise of that authority by that state legitimate in that existential sense. A state may be exercising its authority, for example, in the context of a military occupation, in full compliance with and indeed pursuant to some of the obligations of the Jos in Bello international humanitarian law and human rights law, and therefore be legitimate in those terms. This makes no difference to the more fundamental position applied at by, uh, arrived at by applying mostly different areas of international law which lead us to the conclusion that the authority is in and of itself uh, illegitimate. Now, I say mostly other areas of international law because as well as the international law on the use of force, the jos ad bellum, the, the law that leads to the conclusion of Russia's action being uh, illegal as an act of aggression, there's also a branch of human rights law which itself deals with this existential matter, the law of self-determination. Self-determination exists in human rights law. For example, in Common Article 1 of the two global United Nations covenants on human rights. Now, many instances of extraterritorial activities that are illegal or lack a valid legal basis have this 
legal position arrived at, not only because of the sovereignty right of the host state or the non-state entity that I mentioned earlier, and that those rights have been violated. Also, because these activities involve a violation of the right of external self-determination of the people of that state or non-state entity. External self-determination means the right of a people to be entirely free from certain forms of direct control from outside, and also the right of a people to determine their international status, for example, deciding to be a state, if they don't have this already. In international law, only a very small category of people are understood to have this external right. A right of internal self-determination is different and applies to a larger number of uh, groups uh, of uh, people. But here we're focusing on the, this exceptional external right. First, people in existing states on the basis of the state and its population as a whole as the self-determination unit. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a violation of this collective right of the Ukrainian people. Second, people in remaining colonial territories. So the Moroccan occupation of the Western Sahara, a former Spanish colony, is a violation of the right of the Sahrawi, the people of that territory. And equally, the Palestinian people have this right as people of a territory that was a colony, the British Mandate of Palestine under the League of Nations mandate system. All the examples that I've given of assertions of sovereignty that are unlawful or or legally invalid, have this status in part because they are violative of the self-determination right of the people concerned. So Morocco's purported annexation of Western Sahara uh, being a violation of the right of self-determination of the Sahrawi. In situations where the state is seeking to support a secessionist entity, whose claim to status is invalid, that invalidity is in part due to the lack of a right of external self-determination of the people of the entity as a distinct unit. For example, Russian speakers in uh, Ukraine generally, or Crimea in particular. And the related right of the people corresponding to the broader self-determination unit to remain part of the existing state borders that correspond in this way. So Greek Cypriots in or from the north of Cyprus. Even where sovereignty isn't asserted, the extraterritorial activity may be of a nature that just as it constitutes a significant inroad into the host state's enjoyment of its sovereignty, so also it compromises the ability of the people to run their own affairs, free from external interference. If this has no valid legal basis, for example, as a lawful use of force, then it's a violation of the right of self-determination of that people. Now, when individual incidents of human rights abuses taking place in any of these situations are only scrutinized in terms of how unreasonable or unjustified or indeed barbaric the actions of the extraterritorial state are, the more fundamental question of the legitimacy of the presence itself is not merely ignored, there's also a risk that it's actually validated. Such an approach to scrutiny operates 
on an assumption corresponding to the position taken by that extraterritorial state, that its right to exercise authority is not actually to be questioned. The only inquiry is whether particular incidents taking place as part of that exercise of authority were or are reasonable. In order to speak to the fundamental question of the legitimacy of these activities, it's necessary to engage not with the laws of war, including occupation law, the Geneva Conventions, uh, or most of human rights law, but rather with the law of self-determination and the law on the use of force. So, again, to revisit the killing of Shirin Abouakla and the, kill and the attack on her pallbearers, actually, the very presence of the soldiers in Jenin and Sheikh Jarrah and their exercise of authority was and is in and of itself unlawful in international law as a general matter, regardless of how they exercise this authority. They had and have no right to be in these places in the first place, since Israel has no right to exercise its authority in the West Bank in general and East Jerusalem in particular at all. This leads to a conclusion of illegitimacy. These activities are an unlawful use of force and aggression and a violation of self-determination. So in situations such as these, given the involvement of a violation of the human right of self-determination, the concept of a human rights violation itself has to be disaggregated. There is, on the one hand, a general violation of the right of external self-determination of all the people in the place in question simply by virtue of the extraterritorial activity itself. This is at least a violation of their ability to engage in self-governance and may be aggravated if the extraterritorial state is also asserting a sovereignty claim for itself or a secessionist entity over the territory in question, which presupposes the denial of their right to self-determination with respect to the same territory. On the other hand, there might be particular incidents or broader structures of human rights violations perpetrated by the extraterritorial state and, where relevant, its secessionist proxies. The first case, then, concerns the human rights violations involved in the extraterritorial activity in and of itself. The second case concerns the human rights violations that might occur in the conduct of that activity. Unfortunately, this is a deliberately blank uh, screen, many commentators miss the fundamental self-determination part of this analysis entirely, let alone understanding it in terms of human rights. The war in Ukraine is commonly described only as an aggression when it is characterized as illegal and not also a violation of the legal right of self-determination of the Ukrainian people. Whereas commentators do usually acknowledge that the Palestinian people have a right to self-determination in international law and that the occupation uh, prevents the realization of this, there is also a mistaken view that somehow this doesn't place the continued legitimacy of the existence of the occupation immediately into question. So, paradoxically, they accept that the occupation should not be in existence because this prevents Palestinian self-determination, but that the ending of it should happen only eventually, not necessarily immediately, and that, in the interim, 
Israel can exercise control. Thus, somehow, Israel's current exercise of authority is not presented as a violation of the right of self-determination. This is an entirely mistaken view of the law of self-determination, which requires any impediment to its realization to be removed immediately. Even the international institutions of human rights commonly ignore the human right of self-determination. This can be because the legal framework that they apply does not include it, such as the limited scope of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the treaty applied by the European Court of Human Rights, for example in those cases about Northern Cyprus, and which, unlike the two global human rights covenants, which most, uh, if not all, of the parties to the European Convention are also parties to, unlike those covenants, the European Convention does not include the right of self-determination in its articles. But even bodies who do apply a self-determination-inclusive legal framework, at least ostensibly, such as the two international United Nations committees that monitor the implementation of those two global human rights covenants, and also the two main international human rights NGOs that I mentioned, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, they also inexplicably ignore the right of self-determination. So for these international bodies, human rights considerations are only about how ostensibly humane the conduct of war and occupation is. They are not also concerned with whether the activity, the war, the occupation is in and of itself compatible with the human right to self-determination. This is a dereliction of duty on their part. Although then the UN Human Rights Committee, which is the one of those two committees set up to uh, monitor the implementation of the Covenant, in this case the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, although it has uh, largely neglected uh, the right of self-determination, certainly the right of external self-determination, which is the, uh, the focus today, um, paradoxically, the committee did end up saying something very important about the other area of international law I mentioned that has an equivalent impact on the existential legitimacy of extraterritorial activity. The law on the use of force, the jos ad bellum. And the Human Rights Committee did this even though this area of law is not directly part of the covenant. This is part of general international law. Uh, it is also included, of course, in the United Nations Charter, uh, notably with the prohibition on the use of force in Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter, and the uh, exception to this in Article 51 of the UN Charter, the right of self-defense. The UN Human Rights Committee chose to read in a standard taken from this area of law when interpreting one of the provisions in the Covenant, the Human Rights Covenant, in its 2018 General Comment on the Right to Life, which is set out in Article 6 of that Covenant. The article states that no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of, and the covenant uses the sexist terminology of his life, in, of course interpreted to cover her as well. So the prohibition is on uh, the deprivation of life which is arbitrary. In the general comment, the Human Rights Committee stated, and I quote, state parties the, the states that are parties to that covenant uh, on human rights, engaged in acts of aggression as defined in international law, 
resulting in deprivation of life violate ipso facto Article 6, that article on the right to life, of the Covenant. What the committee is doing here is bringing the test from the law concerning whether a war, which of course involves the deprivation of life, is in and of itself lawful. It's bringing that test, the law on the use of force, or the jus ad bellum, and it's looking at that and saying, if the war doesn't meet that test, and is therefore illegal in those terms, such as Russia's war in Ukraine, then by definition, every deprivation of life perpetrated by that state in that war is unjustified and therefore meets the test for being arbitrary under the covenant and is therefore unlawful in human rights law terms. By contrast, by implication, for a state that is fighting a war that is, for it, a lawful use of force, such as Ukraine's war of self-defense against Russia, deprivations of life committed by Ukraine will not be unlawful in human rights law terms by virtue of the illegitimacy of the purpose. Now, that's not to say, of course, that Ukraine can therefore engage in total war simply because the cause is just. Ukraine must still meet the relevant standards set out in the laws of war and human rights law. So, for example, not um, using lethal force against soldiers who are surrendering. Depri deprivations of life which do not meet these tests will be arbitrary according to that human rights law standard even if the overall reason for the war is a valid one in international law. Whereas by contrast, every single death perpetrated by Russia will be unlawful, even if it meets these other tests. Most international lawyers, states, international organizations, and NGOs have not caught up with this position. Even if human rights law applicability is appreciated, there's still the mistaken assumption that both belligerents are in the same position when it comes to the deprivation of the right to life, that this can be permissible in human rights terms, provided it is compliant with those other standards, uh, in, for example, in the Geneva Conventions, in the laws of war. So when it comes to Russia, the focus tends to be an exclusive one on when it violates international hu humanitarian law, including extreme violations that meet the test for war crimes only. Such an exclusive focus is mistaken because Russia's use of force, unlike Ukraine's use of force, is inherently unlawful. That's to say it is unlawful in ad bellum terms. Every single killing resulting from it is therefore unlawful, including then, for example, the killing of Ukrainian soldiers, even when that may not be prohibited by the laws of war. So to conclude, and to bring things back to the example I began with of the killing of Shirin Abu Akhla in Jenin and the violence against the pallbearers of her coffin in Al-Quds in Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah. What the logic of the argument I've set out today suggests is that when these incidents were assessed by critics of them and defended by Israel, by applying the standards of the laws of war and human rights law,
that regulate the use of force in occupied territories, they were missing the more fundamental point, which leads to a simpler analysis. Since Israel's exercise of authority in these places was illegal as a matter of the yos ad bellum and the human right of self-determination, then every exercise of that authority that caused harm, in this case the killing and the violence against the pallbearers, was an unlawful violation of human rights law simply because of the illegality of the exercise of authority itself. Whether or not Shirin Abu Akla was targeted, whether or not the pallbearers posed a security risk, was beside this more fundamental point. Thank you.